Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to talk about how to compute and how to interpret slash understand the curl of a vector field. The best way to introduce curl is to go back and talk about divergence for a minute. So I want you to think back to lesson eight. In lesson eight, computing the divergence of a 2D vector field was pretty straightforward. You just computed dm dx plus dn dy. Then when you transitioned to uh, lesson 12 and you were doing everything in three-dimensional space, 3D divergence, not much different. Uh, the divergence of a vector field in three-dimensional space, it's another scalar. It's dm dx plus dn dy plus dp dz. So pretty easy to switch from two-dimensional space to three-dimensional space. You just add one more term. You have one more partial derivative to compute and add on. Um, on the other hand, going from two-dimensional space to three-dimensional space for the rotation of a vector field is much more challenging. So remember that the rotation of a vector field was a scalar quantity. And if we want to lift that idea up to three-dimensional space, what is the three-dimensional analog of rotation? Uh, the name of it is curl, the curl of a vector field, but it's a much more complicated quantity. And uh, let me show you why that turns out to be the case. So we'll see that on the next couple slides that we're going to run into. So um, one way to motivate this is to remind you about an alternate way of defining the divergence from previous chapters. So if you recall, del is a differential operator, d dx, d dy, d dz. And we can compute divergence um, by representing it as del dot f. We take the dot product of our differential operator del and our vector field f. And that dot product will give you the divergence of a vector field. Now, we know that the dot product uh, produces scalars, right? Uh, a dot product can take two vectors and produce a single scalar um, after taking our dot product. So divergence is a nice quantity. It's a, a simple scalar quantity. Um, on the other hand, when we try to generalize rotation to three-dimensional space, instead of taking a dot product between del and our vector field, we're going to take the cross product. And the cross product of the two vectors is itself a third vector, which means that curl is going to be more complicated than divergence. Let's take a look. So we're going to define the curl of a vector field by taking, again, our differential operator del and our vector field m, comma, n, comma, p. And we're going to take the cross product of those two vector quantities. So the curl of a vector field is del cross f. And the presence of this cross product makes curl just a little bit more complicated. We get t, dp dy minus dm dz, dm dz minus dp dx, and dn dx minus dm dy when we evaluate this cross product. Now I'm going to leave it to you guys to evaluate that cross product. And I'm also going to leave it to you to decide how you want to memorize the formula for the curl of a vector field. Um, personally, I get all jumbled up when I try to memorize this formula. Just too many letters of the alphabet, uh, too many permutations, and uh, to me it just seems error prone memorizing all three components of that, uh, of that vector without making some sort of you know, mistake mixing something up. So I actually just memorize the idea here. I memorize that, or not even, it's not even memorized. Once you understand it, you don't even have to really memorize it so much anymore. You just know that this is the definition. So I remember that the curl of a vector field is del cross f. And if I ever need the curl formula, I compute this cross product. Um, and then it'll still result in the same formula of dp dy minus dn dz, dm dz minus dp dx, and dn dx minus dm dy. So that's up to you. If you want to make a flashcard with the formula at the bottom of the slide, that's fine. If you want to just remember the cross product idea, that is also appropriate. Um, one thing I do want you guys to notice, though, is that the formula that we just put on the screen, um, it looks a lot like the rotation of a vector field, right? It almost looks like the rotation formula from lesson eight. It's just that it's happening in three different planes. You kind of notice here 
that it almost looks like three different variations on the rotation formula. This looks like rotation. This looks like rotation. This looks like rotation. Now, the one that looks the most familiar is the last one. This looks exactly like the rotation of the vector field formula that you guys knew from lesson eight. And then these first two components, they look like variations or like modifications of that same formula, but with the letters slightly changed. Um, that's not by accident, and that really is a thing. So in the next couple slides, look, let's dive more into the curl of a vector field and see why it makes sense that curl should look like rotation, but just involving three different pairs of variables, three different planes of rotation. So at this point, you might be wondering, wait, why should rotation in three-dimensional space be a vector quantity? Why do we need three different planes of rotation um, in three-dimensional space? But the best way to convince yourself of this was with a simple example. Uh, in this case, I have a picture of an airplane. And what you want to think about is how flying an airplane is a fundamentally more difficult process than driving a car. So yes, a car and an airplane both exist in three-dimensional space. Um, but driving a car is a much more two-dimensional activity because you're just turning a steering wheel left and right. You really only care about the yaw, the XY rotation when you're driving a car. How are you turning left or right on the XY plane as you're driving your car? But with an airplane, you don't just, you can't fly an airplane just with a steering wheel. You can't just turn left, right. You also need to consider the pitch of your airplane, XZ rotation, and the roll of your airplane, yz rotation so we have three different planes of rotation when we're flying an airplane and for that reason when we're talking about curl we need three planes of rotation to capture rotation in three-dimensional space so here's the formula again for the curl of a vector field and what you can see is this vector quantity captures all three of these different types of rotation, these three different planes of rotation. So the X component of curl causes swirl in the YZ plane. And uh, you, the way you can kind of picture this is you could do a little bit of a right hand rule here. So imagine wrapping your fingers around the X axis. Um, so your thumb is pointing with the X axis and your fingers are curling around the X axis. And you can see how your fingers are kind of rotating in the yz plane. So the x component of curl causes rotation in the yz plane. Similarly, the y component of curl causes rotation in the xz plane. And again, imagine kind of a right hand rule here. Take your right hand and wrap your fingers around the y axis. So your thumb is pointing with the y axis and your fingers are rotating in the XZ plane. So the Y component of curl causes swirl in the XZ plane. And then the most familiar of all of these is going to be the Z component of curl, which causes swirl in the XY plane. So again, imagine your fingers wrapped around the Z axis. So your thumb is pointing with the Z axis and your fingers are swirling in the XY plane. And so this was happening even in lesson eight, but we weren't really thinking about three dimensions here. Um, so when we were talking about the rotation of a vector field, um, that what was perpendicular to that rotation was the Z axis. So the Z component of curl causes swirl in the XY plane. So now we need to be able to interpret the curl of a vector field because uh, a vector quantity is more difficult to deal with than a scalar quantity. Um, divergence was real easy, right? If divergence was positive, we have a source. If divergence is negative, we have a sink. If divergence equals zero at a point, that point is neither a source nor a sink. Um, curl is a vector, and vectors can't be positive or negative. So we need a little bit more in order to interpret um, curl at a particular point in space. And so we take advantage of the dot product here. We say, um, you know, pretend that you're at a point x naught, y naught, z naught in three-dimensional space, and pretend you have a vector whose tail is at x naught, y naught, z naught. Um, we can't figure out if curl is positive or negative at a particular point, but we can figure out if curl is positive or negative when we take the dot product with a vector. So if curl dot our vector is positive, 
then we say that our vector field delivers a counterclockwise swirl to our vector v at our point x0, y0, z0. Similarly, if that dot product works out to a negative value, then we say that our vector field is delivering a clockwise swirl to our vector at the point x0, y0, z0. And if that dot product ends up equaling zero, then our vector field is not delivering any swirl to our vector. Now, where does this vector come from? Well, you can make one up on your own, or uh, most, of the times, uh, most of the time that you see this in a triad problem or on a literacy sheet problem, you're gonna be given some vector. You're gonna say, you're gonna be asked, hey, um, what kind of swirl does, the, does our vector field deliver to this given vector v at this given point, x0, y0, z0? So we'll try doing a calculation here, but you should expect v is probably gonna be a given value and you're gonna just be asked to compute. So in order to make the material from the previous slide seem a little more concrete, let's compute an example. So here's a given vector field, negative z squared comma x squared comma y cubed, a given vector, um, it's gonna be the vector two, three, five, but turned into a unit vector, a normalized version of the vector two, three, five, and then a point in space one, zero, negative one. Now our goal is to determine um, what kind of swirl our vector field is delivering to vector v if vector v has its tail at the point one, zero, negative one. And the way we figure out how our vector field is acting on this vector is to compute the dot product curl field at one, zero, negative one dot v. So in order to produce this calculation, the first thing we have to do is compute the curl of our vector field. Um, again, could you memorize that long formula that's um, you know, basically three different variations on rotation um, as a, as a three-dimensional vector, sure. Um, I'm not great at memorizing formulas like that, so I would rather compute a three-by-three three determinant. So I'm writing ijk across my top row, del, which is ddx, ddy, ddz across my middle row, and then my vector field across my bottom row. And I'm gonna compute that three-by-three three determinant. I'm gonna get 3y squared comma negative 2z comma 2x. Now remember, since curl needs to be a vector quantity, one quick sanity check is after you do your calculation, make sure you got a vector with three different components for curl. If you somehow got a scalar, you probably made a mistake at this point in the problem. All right, moving along. Next, we care specifically about the curl of our vector field at the point 1, 0, negative 1, just because that point was given to us. So crunch the numbers and you get 0, 2, 2. And finally, the calculation that, that will tell us what kind of swirl our vector field delivers to our vector at the point 1, 0, negative 1 comes from taking this dot product. So I'm going to take my curl field at 1, 0, negative 1 and my given vector, and I'm going to compute the dot product between the two. And I get some positive number, 2.596. Since that number is positive, we know that vector v is going to feel a, a counterclockwise swirl at the point 1, 0, negative 1. Our vector field is delivering a counterclockwise swirl to v at the point 1, 0, negative 1. All right, so that's going to wrap up this video. Um, now that we know how to calculate and interpret uh, curl field dot a vector, we're going to be able to move on to Stokes' theorem, and that's going to be kind of our capstone theorem from this course. Um, Stokes' theorem is going to be um, yet another variation on the Gauss-Green theorem for three-dimensional space.